So I thought I would just do a little overview of pulse electromagnetic field therapy. Even for those of you that don't want to take the course, it's a little bit of information for you just to revise what you know about it. Um, and if you do have the equipment, just a little bit of check on there, uh, thinking about the research um, behind it and just a little overview. So we're just going to hop into that now. <clears throat> Right, okay, so just first of all, looking at the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is the range of all types of electromagnetic radiation. Now, those of you that have done any courses with me before um, or have been on the photobiomodulation course or even studied electrophysical agents with me in the past, um, this is normally the first thing that we look at. Um, and I just think it helps to have a look at the electromagnetic spectrum and see where we're looking, what regions we're working in. So the thing with pulse electromagnetic field therapy is that it can become, there is quite a lot of confusion. Um, and as I'm always trying to iron out any confusion for you guys, because, you know, going out there and looking at the literature and all the manufacturers bump um, and speaking to different people, it can become very confusing. You know, what is this type of piece of equipment? What, um, what frequency is it at? what does it um what does it do in comparison to this one uh how does the research back up this particular machine but not this particular machine so pmf is not just everything um and so the research as always that we find um the variables within the research as far as the settings and treatment times etc are concerned you know they're very variable on the papers um and so it's very very confusing it's almost impossible to do a meta-analysis of the research that we have on this subject because it's all so variable and so that means we have to sort of take it piecemeal and see what we can can work out about it so it's not like we can just go to you know PubMed or Google Scholar and say pulse electromagnetic field horses and we're going to get loads of papers we're not going to um, so we need to know when we're working with pulse electromagnetic field devices um, what type of device we're working with how it relates to other pieces if, if you're trying to compare it to other pieces um, and also you know what the research is behind that probably not necessarily always behind that actual piece of equipment but behind that frequency and that length of treatment i mean this is all stuff that we dive into into the course because it's, it's very detailed but i just wanted to give you an overview of that so that if you do have your own piece of equipment you can pick it apart a little bit you can go back to the manufacturers and say what is this this and this and you can get a little bit more understanding i am a very strong believer that if we're using anything whether that be a modality or a technique with our animals in our in our clinics we must know what the research is to back that up that's I, I believe that's our responsibility to to do that so if you're a nurse and you're working with physio uh, you're working with physio in practice or if you're a physiotherapist or if you're a rehab therapist or if you have any of this equipment whatever you you are a professional and owners are relying on you to recommend the best treatment for their animal without any knowledge of what all these things are. So it is our professional responsibility to understand what we're working with, how it works, um, and, and try and decipher some of the actual research from the manufacturer's bump, which there can be quite a lot of, as you all probably know. So first of all, just looking at the electromagnet electromagnetic spectrum. So when I'm talking here about pulsed electromagnetic field therapy or PEMP as some people call it or PMT some people call it um, there's lots of different names for it I'm actually talking about being in right down at the very very lowest end of the electromagnetic spectrum very very low frequency um, and we're looking at um, extremely low frequency so we have very low frequency extremely low frequency between one and 300 hertz and actually some of the equipment is ex super extremely low frequency between one and 30 hertz so this will vary between the different pieces of equipment that you might use or even the settings in the piece of equipment that you use but generally in therapy for pulse ele electromagnetic field therapy or low uh, extremely low frequency we're looking at between one and a hundred hertz so we're right 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 down at this lower end of the electromagnetic spectrum 
Now, where some people do get confused, and this is, you know, very difficult to, to pick it apart because of uh, the different papers we use different terms, different manufacturers use different terms, and they quite often bundle it all under pulse electromagnetic field. You know, all of the waves here in the electromagnetic spectrum are electromagnetic radiation. Um, so it's a term that can be used to cover anything, really, if you like. Um, within the electromagnetic spectrum. But pulse electromagnetic fields, when we're talking about therapy, we're right down at this lower end. There is also radio frequency treatment, um, which is 448 kilohertz. Not all of it is. There's a bigger spectrum than that. There's radio frequency region uh, or radio wave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. But it tends to be the therapy devices that are radio frequency of 448 kilohertz about. So for those, we're looking right up here. And then also we've got pulsed shortwave therapy or shortwave therapy. If it's not pulsed, but um, pulse shortwave therapy. Um, which is very often, people will very often say this is uh, electromagnetic field therapy. So something like the ACC loop um, would be, is actually 27.12 megahertz. So you're in a much far, far, far away on this spectrum than you are with the low frequency pulse electromagnetic post electromagnetic field. Now, really, this isn't necessarily a big problem if people you know, that in fact, the manufacturers themselves call it PEMP or T-PEMP sometimes. It's not actually that big of a problem when it comes to the treatment because they're all good treatments. Um, but when you're looking at the research, you can't quote some research on pulse shortwave, 27.12 megahertz, and apply that to extremely low frequency at 30 hertz. They're just two different things you can't say the research says this works but you're actually talking about something in a totally different frequency um, so that's where we need to be careful with the crossover and, and we as practitioners need to understand that difference what type of device are we working with you're actually in a radio frequency region here when you're working with 27.12 megahertz and it's more appropriate that that would be called a radio frequency treatment rather than a, a pulsed electromagnetic field treatment. Um, but like I say, these are all interchangeable, but it is important that you do know the difference because they are different treatments and they do have different research, a different evidence base. So just looking, what are the benefits for using this therapy then for animals? So let's just be thinking about pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, that extremely low frequency. <clears throat> what are the benefits then for animals? Because it's been used for a long time um, with animals, you know, very a long, long time ago, 25 years ago, probably when I first worked in my first um, magnetopulse, I think it was. And it was a great big, huge machine um, that you always need to bring in on a trailer. Um, and it was plugged in and it was a massive machine that, that we used. Um, and or there were crates originally there were crates with dog like the whole crate was um w w had the field in it um and so they've got much smaller and smaller and smaller you can see here in this respond systems picture the tiny box and in fact up here on the fmbs um picture up here uh, there's also a, a very small control box now and they're run by battery so they're much much smaller and more usable and the benefit the great benefit of this treatment is that it can be used at home and it can be and should be used regularly. So daily or up to three times a day even um, will be some of the recommendations for a short burst of treatment for say 10, 15 minutes um, is a very good way to, to give the owner something to do at home. Um, it can be a beneficial uh, revenue stream for your practice if you have equipment that you rent out to the owners so they have that equipment at home during the week or two weeks between the, the, the times they see you or their session times they can have this equipment at home you can have multiple of these and you can be renting them out and it's a really good revenue stream so that's always really really good thing to have for your practice um, and, it, and it's great that it can be used regularly at home you know, there's lots of anecdotal reports of, of animals seeking out their pulse electromagnetic field mat or, you know, um, if there's an area where they go for their treatment, they actually go and they ask for the treatment. And, you know, I believe that to be true because I have seen that myself. Um, but if they go on it, um, 
they shouldn't really feel anything happening um, or hear anything happening, but afterwards they feel better, then they're going to want to seek that out. Um, so it's really, really useful to be able to give to people to use at home. It's non-invasive. You don't have to put gel on. You don't have to shave anything. You don't have to poke anything in. It's just there's a mat lay on it there's a rug put it over you know you can even put pulse electromagnetic field will travel through bandages and things like that so it's uh, embedding so if you've got an animal that's nervous you can lay it in their bed and you can just cover it, a dog or cat you can lay it in their bed and cover it and they can just come in and sleep on it and not really know it's happening so it's very easy and very safe to use very non-invasive and very well tolerated by the animals so where are we and what are the clinical uses? Now, we have very little robust clinical trials with animals. Um, and so we can always look at preclinical trials and say that they suggest this and that and the other. And it's all wonderful. Um, but if it's carrying that, that has to really for us to be very confident in that and to really be able to stand behind a treatment, it needs to be carried out. We need to have clinical trials. Um, and they need to be positive, obviously. Now, we don't have those with animals. We've got a few. Um, some are not positive um, or don't show any change. Um, we have a few that seem to be positive, but when you actually pick the research paper apart, there are questions over you know, the variables um, and they're not controlled trials. So it's a bit limited, really, as to what what we can say, what we can actually say with animals this will work we don't have the evidence yet to say that and we need that so if anybody wants to do any studies this is a good study to do um so we're going on pre-clinical and animal model studies um so laboratory um experiments um and and in vitro uh experiments and we're also going on that has been carried over to the human clinical trials um, and there have been it's mixed. There's a, quite a lot of human clinical trials with, with PMF. Um, the variables are very different. Again, the settings will be different. The intensities will be different. Um, so it's very hard to just pull that all together and say, yes, it works. No, it doesn't. And there there are some really, really positive studies that really do look like this is a really, really good therapy and can have very good effect but also there are some that are ne not necessarily negative but don't really show positive that we that we think we could see or want to see but there is a very good body of evidence um in in the preclinical and animal model studies and the human clinical trials that you can have an influence on biological activities such as inflammation pain transduction tissue growth and repair um and vasomotor tone so vasodilation can is a is a an effect that has been very well measured and other physiological processes so we can reasonably confidently say that we can hope to bring about those effects we can't yet say we definitely can do that with animals but the anecdotal evidence is very positive so we need to weigh this up but it's just something you need to be aware of if you have a pmf device and you you know you read the manufacturer's bump and it says it can do this that and the other your you know your horse is going to be wonderful and, and amazing it's going to do all this we think it probably is true and it's certainly very possible looking at what studies have been done on humans um, and these preclinical studies but we can't actually say that definitely that does work with a horse or a dog because we just don't have the evidence yet to prove that so just something to bear in mind with your wording and what your when you're using equipment, how you're thinking about it and how you're sort of talking to your clients about it. You need to be a bit careful there because if they actually said to you, show me the evidence, you'd struggle to show them the evidence. So it's very useful based on all of that for osteoarthritis, so reduction in pain and swelling, very useful. If we can reduce that pain again, reduce that swelling, get them moving, it's gonna be the first stage of being able to get them moving and get, get some improvement with osteoarthritis. Bone healing, so non-union and acute fractures. Um, there's positive studies to show that that uh, PMF can have a, a very good effect on that. All of this within the course we go into much more detail on. Uh, pain, uh, chronic and acute pain, again, going back to osteoarthritis, but also other forms of post-surgical pain and stuff like that has been studied. Um, and wounds, it's not very often used for wounds, but it can be, um, and tendons and ligaments, etc. So if we could get that research in the animal 
uh, in the animal world, uh, in the animal clinical trials, then it would be really, really useful for any of you that are at university and looking for a, a project to do. Um, this would be a nice study to, to carry out. Right, so your actions then for this week. Are you using PMF? So if you have a device in your surgery, in your surgery, sorry, in your clinic that you say, yes, I use it and it's PMF. Do you know it's actually PMF? Is it low, uh, for extremely low frequency pulse electromagnetic field? If so, find out exactly what frequencies you're using and source the key research to back it up. Anything you use, you should be able to pull out the research and tell somebody why you use it and how it's backed up. So if you're using it in practice, you must know that the answers to that question. Questions. Um, and, and if you're if you are interested in providing PMF, but you don't actually use it at the moment, then your action would be to start some research on the available modalities. So I hope that helps this week just to cover PMF and just give you a little bit of an overview of where we are um, as far as the research is concerned and the different frequencies. I hope that's helped. So if you're not signed up to Knowledge Nibbles and you would like to be, then please just head over to our website at animalrehabhealth.academy forward slash knowledge and you can sign up there. Thanks very much and I'll see you next week.